Hello, hello. <laughs> hello, Booktube. It's Tilly from Tilly Shelf and Rose from Scally Dangling About the Books. And it's our discussing drama for July. Yes, and for July, we have read The School for Scandal by Sheridan. And we read it because it is Jane Austen July and this book, uh, this play has got quite strong Jane Austen um, connections. But before we dive on into those, um, how about I just quickly summarise what went on in the play? Do. Yes. So, um, so this is a comedy of manners. It was written and performed in 1777. It first came on in the Drury Lane Theatre in London. Um, and it basically, there's no central character really, but it revolves around um, two young men um, who live in, in London in the height of fashion. And one of them has all the goodness and the other all the appearance of goodness, uh, to borrow a phrase from uh, Pride and Prejudice. Um, so these two young men, um, there is Surface, who is superficial um, but pretends to be really lovely um, and Charles's brother who is a bit profligate and very much in debt um, but is eventually shown to be quite uh, kind-hearted and, and caring um, even though he's got absolutely no control of how he spends money. Um, they have two kind of protector figures and um, so one of them is Sir Peter Teasel Peter is, Sir Peter Teasel, yeah. Um, and Sir Peter Teasel has been their guardian. And then they have this other protective figure, Sir Oliver. And Sir Oliver is their very rich uncle who has been away in India for many, many years. Um, and he has just come back, but he's come back secretly because he's heard um, some bad reports of his nephews. And what he's decided to do is to test them, to find out which of them is morally better. And then he's going to decide who to give his fortune to on the basis of who's a better person. Surrounding these characters, um, we've got a few um, principally female characters who are responsible for creating a storm of gossip and uh, scandalous rumours um, around these young men and, and other people in their acquaintance. Um, so there's Lady Sneerwell and she comments that her reputation was damaged in her youth, so she now kind of sets out to damage everybody else's reputations. Um, we've got a very good young woman called Maria who must say about five words in the whole play, but she is, you know, the, the good young girl for which the, the worthy young man will be rewarded in the end, that kind of thing. Um, and, um, and then we've got Mrs. Kander who just kind of goes around gossiping all the time and says, oh no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one to gossip. I'm never one to gossip. Oh, anything. I wouldn't gossip. <laughs> and I heard the other day these people gossiping about this person and wasn't that dreadful? And then off you go. <laughs> Isn't it so awful that people spreading these horrible rumors about this specific person doing this specific thing? Um, yeah, so um, it's, it's, it's a very amusing selection of, of characters, I suppose. Um, and then there's also Sir Peter Teasel has got a much younger wife, Lady Teasel, who is brought up from the country as a young, innocent uh, country girl and introduced her into London, whereupon she has not behaved exactly as he wished her to, shall we say. His country um, wife decides she wants to be a lady of fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that'll probably do for uh, a summary as well. well. And, and maybe I'll, I should just say a little bit about Sheridan, shall I? Yeah, go ahead. It, yes, because this plays by, by Richard Brinsley Sheridan, and he was one of the, the big playwrights of the sort of late 18th, very beginning of the 19th century. So he was born in 1951 in Ireland, so technically he's Irish. He actually left Ireland, sorry? It probably wasn't 1951, was it 1751? Did I say 1951? You did. Oh, carry on, carry on. 1751 is what we're talking about. 1751, <laughs> yep, yeah, in Dublin. And, um, but he moves to England to school when he's like 11 and never basically, I mean, he may have visited Ireland again, but he never lives in Ireland again. So so he's he's perhaps more English than Irish ultimately, mm -hmm. but, but you know, he's, he's one of the, 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 the the, like a bit like um, uh, Shaw and Wild, and you know, there's a number of them that over the time that were sort of come from Ireland but end up with their career in in, in England, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he, how does he end up as a playwright? This is an interesting. I like this story. So he was living in Bath when he was like 20, 21, and he falls in love with. Um, a young woman, a teenager, who's an actress and a singer um, who performs in Bath and her, her father was like the big name sort of putter on of plays in, in, in Bath at the time, uh, Linley. And, uh, and they elope 
when he was 21 and she was 16, they eloped to France um, so that they can... Gosh, scandalous. ...get married. Very scandalous. Very scandalous indeed. And because uh, he knew that neither set of parents would approve of their relationship because his parents think that she's not posh enough and her father wants her to be, you know, a money-spinning performer um, mm -hmm. and not to get to get married in any way. She was too young. But uh, ultimately, the families sort of agree and they end up properly married. And But he wants to be able to support her and wants her to not have to perform mm -hmm. anymore. Um, so he, he thinks, oh, I'll try writing plays. And so he writes The Rivals um, in 1775, the year Jane Austen was born, um, which is very which is successful, and then Joanna, and then um, School for Scandal in 1777. So, and he was still only 26 when he wrote School for Scandal. So, and he he buys into the Drury Lane Theatre um, in London and kind of takes that on. So- uh, At the age 26 to write School for Scandal, that's quite an impressive- Yes. Like, it, I mean, it's it's quite, in a way it's light and frivolous and witty, but it to me, it kind of had a mature edge to it, quite a yes. mature- um, Yes, it's quite a sophisticated sentiment almost. I would say. Yeah. yeah. And he and he in writing The Rivals and School for Scandal, he sort of draws on the sort of restoration comedy sort of style of of play, but then brings it up to date for the for the late eighteenth century and and, and and with sort of slightly different sort of twist, as it were. A little bit more moral and a little bit more sensitive. So um yeah, and then he 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 um he lives long enough to um, to read Pride and Prejudice, which is one of the links with Jane Austen. Is that he he really he he recommended Pride and Prejudice to, to one of his friends and said you must read this because it's really funny, you know, really clever. So which is lovely, which is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were the other um, Jane Austen links for him? Yes, I was gonna, I was going to say I meant to say at the start. You know, we want to talk about Sheridan, but we want to talk about Jane Austen more. So we're going to exploit all of the connections with School for Scandal. Um, so School for Scandal was one of the plays that was mentioned in Mansfield Park when the um, young people are deciding what play to perform. Um, and it, in keeping with Lover's Vows, it kind of fits with that idea that they are selecting from a range of plays that are maybe not entirely morally suitable for the situation that they're in. Um, I didn't mention it, but School for Scandal does involve um, a little bit of suggestions of some extramarital liaisons and, and things oh, like that. But more than suggestions, well, I mean, it's not like it's got <laughs> okay. things, but, but it's pretty yeah. explicit that people are looking to have affairs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, using very interesting persuasive techniques of, oh, if your husband suspects you of having an affair, the best way to stop him from suspecting you is to have an affair. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Clearly that works. Yeah, because then you <laughs> be able to really convincingly lie about it if you really have an affair, whereas if you're having to pretend you're, you're you know, try and convince him of you're not doing something that you're not doing, you'll never be convincing. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So bizarre. So you can see how it kind of it kind of fits in with Mansfield Park a little bit. Yes, um, well, very much so. Just in terms of its popularity at the time as well, I wanted to mention that it's also mentioned in um, Belinda by Maria Edgeworth, which I read earlier this month. Um, I think it was just such a well-known play at the time and it, it was really so popular that it became kind of a byword for the kind of um, the rumour mill that was underway in fashionable society. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the best Jane Austen connection um, is, of course, that she herself starred in it. Yeah. Um, so she took on the role of the vivacious, gossiping Mrs. Candor. Um, yeah. Did you want to say a little bit the, more the about... hypocritical, um, pretends to be virtuous, but is actually, um, yeah, I mean, it's a great sort of Jane Austen-y sort of guy. You can just imagine her performing with relish. This was in, um, uh, it was like a sort of a, a house party for Twelfth Night, and... Um, they were did a performance of um of the school for scandal and um she, it was this was in oh so it was when she was in her 30s and um her it's it's in someone else's sort of recollection uh so William Heathcote of Hursley Park in Hampshire so he was invited he was part of this 12th night party and he says um that Jane Austen drew the character of Mrs Candor in Sheridan's school for scandal like they took you know who was going to play which part that she she drew that one and she said she assumed the part with great spirit you could just just imagine yeah. and, and we I shouldn't be surprised that she was 
you know, put on a good performance as he saw it in that one, because amateur theatricals was an Austin family um, enthusiasm. Yeah, I, so I didn't know until we were talking about this just before that it was something that the whole family was very, very passionate about. It wasn't just a casual, oh, every now and then we're going to put on a play. It was something yeah. they were actually quite committed to as a, as a, as a pastime. Yeah, well, they apparently they used to do it in the dining room at Steventon, the rectory at Steventon, where, where she grew up. And then they were they were so keen that they actually converted the barn at Steventon to work as a sort of a theatre for their performances. And the whole family would take part. And also, you know, um, Jane Austen's father and mother took in like kind of schoolboys. Mm -hmm. they, they ran like a sort of informal sort of school for, for 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 boys and and they would all take part in it as well and cousins and neighbors and would all get yeah. drawn in for these these performances and uh, it, uh one of the things that i read for jane austen in july was the real the real jane austen by paula byrne and mm -hmm. she, she's actually written another book that's all about jane austen in the theater but there's a chapter in that and one of the the little gems in in that was that when um jane's father henry austen retired um, and they were moving to Bath. They had like a sale of their unwanted household goods at Steventon. And one of the lots in that sale is named is theatrical scenes. So they actually had like bits of what we presume was scenery from their performances that got then got sold um, that they'd used in the barn, so, which is just like, so she, yeah. she genuinely, you know, really did perform yeah. in plays and really enjoy it. Yeah, and have a lot, lot, a lot of love for that pastime, which is then it becomes quite interesting that she turns it on its head in Mansfield Park and kind of yes. plays on the scandalous aspects of it. But then I suppose it's it's very diff different her performing those plays in a family like with her mother and father present, um, and presumably like the choice of play and so on uh, yes. versus yeah. Mansfield Park. Yeah. yeah, but also I think at the same time having taken part in them, she she would know that one of the enjoyments of performing something like School for Scandal is it gave young people the opportunity to interact and get physically closer than they normally could. And you know, and that's just yeah. what you see in Mansfield Park. So she 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 understood that it did create those opportunities. Yeah, it set things up maybe for um relationships to develop, I suppose. Yeah. But then it's so funny then that people have taken the Mansfield Park story to imply that she disappeared the theater. The theater. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when, and in, even when she wasn't acting in plays, she was a very keen attender of the theatre, wasn't she? So she, when she could, she went to two or three plays every week. Um, so we can probably assume that she'd seen The School for Scandal, given that it was so popular at the time. Probably not in 1777, because she would have been about two years old. Um, but in subsequent performances, um, she definitely, either in private theatre theatres or in Bath or in London, um, or even Southampton, Southampton, she may well have had the chance to to see it on stage as well as acting in it herself. Yeah, because yeah, she was a, 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 when she was in this, but she was a regular theatre goer, even to the point from her letters and so on, you know, she writes about getting tickets and about seeing like the, the latest actresses, you know, the, who's, 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 who's trending as it were, that she wanted yeah. to, to, to see those. So, so yeah, uh, she was someone who, who relished the theatre. And all yeah. sorts of plays, everything from Shakespeare to fast to, you know, and, and this sort of fashionable comedy. Yeah. yeah. And I think you can see, I suppose, that her work is influenced by the theatre to an extent. So the way that she handles dialogue um, and dialogue that kind of stands on it on its own and really um, governs the scene, I suppose, um, down to the way that she uses kind of entrances and exits and scenes where it becomes very important who is where. But the, classic example is the wilderness at Southerton um, where you know, <laughs> and, you know Mr. Yeah. Mr. Rushworth <laughs> enter stage left Maria and Crawford um, exit <laughs> exit over the back you know like you, you can really see the kind of dramatic setup for that and the vision that she had in her mind uh, it always reminds me of a play to read that scene yeah. um, and and but, the, the other thing that you you get in some in in, in the books and I think you, you get it in persuasion and I, just to think like moments when people overhear another character talking about them which is very like the sort of thing you get in the school for scandal isn't it that, yeah. that <laughs> sort of or 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 you you see a bit of dialogue and you get one version of things and then someone sort of goes away and perhaps 
does a, a, a soliloquy of sorts that where you're hearing their thoughts and and she does that in 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 the novels really well yeah 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 so I, I suppose that kind of overhearing thing that's this brilliant scene in school for scandal where um not just one but two people wind up concealed in different places in the room and there's this one character trying to <laughs> like have a conversation with other people trying to make sure that nobody hears the wrong thing when they're from their hiding places <laughs> um that's very um entertaining i found that that seemed quite a, quite amusing <laughs> and then it all comes kind of tumbling down yeah yeah but yeah. like 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 um in pride and prejudice at the meriton meriton ball when yes elizabeth hears darcy talking mm. you know and yes yeah yeah so it's that 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 sort of those sort of misunderstandings or you know yeah yeah are very think, theatrical which which is something i guess i hadn't really thought about in terms of her style mm -hmm. of her dialogue and so on until I understood that she she was a theatre goer and a, and, and yeah. amateur, amateur performer as it were. I yeah. think characterization as well um, you can see Sheridan's characters as being very much um, caricatures potentially and maybe lacking they might have more depth than earlier theatrical characters in terms of restoration plays that he was um, building from um, but they they do lack depth and I think Jane Austen has taken quite a similar approach to um, characterization and caricatures and extreme characters but just given them a little bit more sympathy so for me um, Mrs Candor really reminded me of Miss Bates but Miss Bates is a character that because her tongue just runs away with her but Miss Bates is someone who we have a lot of we do manage to have a lot of sympathy for even if we do yes, find her yes. a bit irritating and sometimes almost hypocritical um, yeah. or like Lady, Sneer, Lady Sneerwell is is a um uh, like a Mrs Elton character, or yeah, you yeah, know that, of trying to manipulate people, you know, and yeah. and yeah, yeah, trying to control people. Or even I maybe saw her as maybe a bit more like Mary Crawford, Ooh. um, like yes. this kind of fashionable London woman who um is trying is out to get what she wants, um, and she doesn't care really who she's affecting in her way to get what she wants. Well, and I, I thought um, also like the, the the two the two brothers, or even Lady Susan. Sorry, I'd, Lady oh, oh, Lady yeah. Susan Vernon. Oh, <laughs> Lady Susan is very school for scandal kind of character, yeah. isn't she? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. No, but I was thinking about the, the, I was thinking the two about brothers. The two, the two brothers, you know, Joseph Surface and Charles. Um, that one of the one of the issues, I guess, is that their father died. They they they're orphans, and and although. So Peter Teasel has tried to be a sort of moral guardian for them. That 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 thing of of being not having the right parental um, upbringing is is the Crawfords, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and I think um, and to a certain extent because of the way that Lady Bertram is and Sir Thomas going away to a certain extent, it's like the Bertram siblings as well. And I think that um, Charles. Um, with his spending lots of money, but in the end turning out to be kind of redeemable, um, is very much like Tom Tom Bertram, the young Tom Bertram, who uh, you know spends a lot of money gambling, but at the end of the day, um, he means well. Um, versus um, the other one, Joseph, um, with the you know ability to appear very good and to manipulate people very well, he's very much a Mr. Crawford type character, where his actual core is morally corrupt but he has the ability to know what people expect him to behave like and to appear better than he is. Yeah. 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 So um, did you enjoy the play? Did I enjoy the play? I think I enjoyed it because I am very engrossed in sort of that time period and kind of quite familiar with these types of characters appearing in either Jane Austen's works or other works from the time. Um, I think I enjoyed that and enjoyed getting more of an insight into the things that Jane Austen was reading and the things that were influencing her. I think possibly as a work of drama, it has less modern applicability. It translates less well. I mean, you could you could say that the gossip mill is a bit like kind of what we'd have now with social media, but you'd have to kind of stretch it quite hard to make the things that they're kind of more, you'd, you'd have to adapt it quite a long way to make it feel relevant in the modern era. I don't know, how about you? Well, well that, I was going to say it is a play that has been, it's been consistently performed mm. from 1777 right up to the present day. You know, it, it's never yeah. gone out of fashion as, as a, a play performed, I think. It's, it comes round at regular intervals. So yeah. there's, 
I, I mean, I think because it is, it is genuinely funny. Yes, you know, it, it definitely, definitely is. You know, it, it's kind of got farcical elements, you know, but also the, the dialogue is very witty and yeah. it, in a very, um, I mean, my, my, my favourite characters in it were um, uh, uh, Sir Peter Teasel and Lady Teasel, his, mm -hmm. his young wife who, who, as you say, has been, he, he married the daughter of like a country squire thinking, well, she'll be all sort of innocent and, and grateful and biddable. And, and then, he, you know, she gets to London and it's like, whoa! Yay! <laughs> I know I want the latest fashion, and I want to get in with the scandal mongers, and I'm going to, you know, and 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 um, I really enjoyed her character, and I enjoyed the banter between them. It, it, as, I mean, it sort of was a bit of a Beatrix, Beatrice and Benedict sort of to and fro. You know, some of their exchanges are just like so smart that it's a joy. Um, yeah. So, so I did get a lot of enjoyment from, from that. Though the overall sort of plot is a bit, you know, yeah, I I enjoyed that that pairing slightly less, I think, because I found them to be very unequal, and I feel like Sir Peter Teasel has, you know, he's he deliberately kind of tries to. He, it feels like he deliberately tries to pick a wife who is ignorant, who he can control, and then when he finds out that he can't necessarily control her, then he's very upset and jealous about that. Um, and then there's a little bit at the end where they kind of reconcile and then she says kind of, oh, I'm, I'm now going to have to go back and live in the country and pretend to be happy about that. So I, I don't like, although there is some sign of genuine um, affection and connection between them, I, I, it kind of, it left me a little bit unhappy for her as a character, although I don't necessarily approve of all of the things that she did when she was trying to keep up with the height of fashion oh but you see i i you see i i i felt like he gets his just desserts he thinks he's going to get this controllable you know sweet harmless country girl he gets he, he finds out he's got someone who's just as clever as him and yeah. more determined than him and he ends up in effect being the one that concedes although you know she because you know he 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 ends up saying you know yes i'll settle my money on you yeah you can have a divorce if you if you, if you you know separation if you want one actually I really like you and I really want you and you know and it's her I think she ends up in the position of, of power in a way that I found quite sort of satisfying I just can't get over that little speech at the end where she's saying that she's got got to go and live in the country and be unhappy like I, I don't know you might be right you might be right I think it would depend how you acted it and how you played it whether or not she genuinely felt for him or whether she felt that having a divorce would be worse than having an unhappy marriage which yeah. may well have been true at the time yeah um, yeah the characters that the character that I really like was Sir Oliver who's this rich uncle excuse me who's come over from India um and I kind of loved it's a, it reminded me of our mutual friend um a little bit where um you know, you, you've, you've got this person that you've got a kind of a link to, but you don't know them. So you decide that you want to like suss them out in disguise. Um, so he shows up and he pretends to be a money lender. Um, and then he pretends to be a poor relation and he just like tests his nephews. And I, I really enjoyed that kind of um, slightly Shakespearean dress up pretend element. Um, yeah. I found that was yes. quite enjoyable. Yeah, no, that, 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 that was. I am, um, which does mean we should just touch on the uh, the anti-Semitism. Yes, I was going to say it's, it's yeah. as I've mentioned, money lending is possibly the right time to just mention. Um, yeah, very. I suppose very of the time representation of. Um, and 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 it's interesting yeah. because like the 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 Jewish character is not actually he's not very. I mean, he's quite sympathetically portrayed yeah. in a way, but it's just, it's a bit stereotyped. And, and I guess that's perhaps not surprising for the times. It, it's not, it, he's not made to be, um, you know, a bad character or, you yeah. know, he, he actually, he, he, it's quite a, yeah. it's an it's okay. He's not part. malicious in any no. way. Um, and in that way, you could say, if you're comparing him to other um, Jewish men, Jewish moneylenders in theatre, um, he's, he's less, um, he does does less bad deeds than Shylock, but then Shylock at the end gets a kind of 
um, he, Shylock gets a speech where he kind of protests against the way that he's treated as being a Jew, whereas um, Moses, this character is called, um, just kind of appears, acts as a moneylender and then disappears. It, there's no, um, yeah, there's no yeah, debate yeah. over that role of him yeah, as a yeah. as a moneylender who is Jewish. Yeah, so, yeah, true. Um, I, you know, like sometimes it's nice to to read something from the play. I, I just, I just. I've, see, I'm trying to convince you about how brilliant the um, repartee between um, the two. I agree, the repartee is good. I just don't think that the relationship <laughs> is, you know, long term okay, so, relationship goals. So, Sir Peter is is complaining about how um, the money she's spending on um, on cut flowers and uh, yes, and uh, to spend as much to furnish your dressing room with flowers in winter as would suffice to turn the pantheon into a greenhouse. And and her comeback to that is. Lord Sir Peter, am I to blame because flowers are dear in cold weather? You should find fault with the climate and not with me. For my part, I'm sure I wish it was spring all year round and roses grew under one's feet. <laughs> she's, she's not taking any shit from him. <laughs> yeah, um, it's true. You know, you know, she she really can fight back. Oh yeah. Um, I just don't think I feel for both of them. I don't yes. think that it's a relationship that is good for either of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even when they've said at the end, "Oh, I'm never going to be bad again," yeah. I don't. I still don't think that they stand yeah. much of a chance of being happy yeah. together in the long term. No, and and it, and it and it brings back us back to one of you know Jane Austen's classic themes, isn't it? About why did people marry Get married in yeah. those days? And and you know, was it a when was it an economic decision on the part of a woman as opposed to one yeah. of genuine affection as it was and if going back to Mansfield Park Mary Crawford refers to a number of her friends who got married to um like rich old men and you know whether or not they were happy about it um and also Lady Susan Vernon um and yeah. her, I've not read Lady Susan this year but I watched the Love and Friendship and there's this brilliant line that may be part of the script I don't know whether it's from the book but she says um oh you know it was a great mistake on your part to marry this this man too too old to be agreeable and too young to die <laughs> <laughs> that that that's yes very much the the um the the lady teasable kind of dilemma I think yeah and he decides actually I've made my bed and I've got to lie in it and I'll make the best of it mm. so I, I think we've had a good a good unpicking of that yeah, we've had a nice discussion about it and I hope it's been interesting it. interesting and enjoyable. Yeah. And what and a great month Jane Austen July has been. Oh, what a joy. What a joy. And thank you. Thank you to the Jane Austen July house yet again for, for, for my favourite event of the year. Yeah. And um and we'll we've got to pick what we're gonna do for um our August yeah, play. Discussing drama. Yeah, I, I think it should definitely not be a. We we should go for something modern because we've had quite yeah. a few classic plays in a row. So we'll we'll be we'll, we'll be back with something a little bit more contemporary. Yes. Contemporary. Bye. Bye. Oh, it still says recording. Oh. oh.